Okay, we'll get started. Good afternoon from Seattle. I'm Xiao Jing Wu, curator of Japanese and Korean art at the Seattle Art Museum. Before we start the program today, although we're meeting virtually, I would like to acknowledge that the Seattle Art Museum is located on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people. We honor our ongoing connection to these communities past, present, and future. Welcome to our Winter Saturday University Lecture Series, Art and Renewal in Times of Crisis in Asia. As we are all facing the challenges of the current pandemic, along with systematic racism, threats, democracy, climate change, and many other social and political issues around the world, we feel the urge to think about this moment in history in a broader context and to consider how artists responded to crisis and conflicts in Asia. This series of five talks present revealing cases from Japan, China, Armenia, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Some of you have asked why a Saturday university lecture is taking place on a Friday afternoon. That's because we're fortunate to have Professor Timon Screech to kick off this series for us from Japan and it's Saturday morning for him. I guess it's just a trick of the virtual world we live in. But please be reminded the remaining four talks will be on Saturday mornings, Seattle time from 10 to 11.30 as in the past. Next slide, please. Many of you also inquired about the recordings of the last lecture series, Color in Asian Art. They are available on Seattle Art Museum's Facebook. We understand that not everyone uses Facebook and we're working on live streaming the lectures to YouTube as well. So please bear with us as we work out the best possible way to make the recordings available for you. Next slide. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to thank our long-standing partners for Saturday University Lecture Series, the Jackson School for International Studies at the University of Washington and the Elliott Bay Book Company. And most importantly, I would like to add a special thank you to the person who organized this lecture series and all the others in the past 11 years, Sarah Loudon. Next slide, please. Sarah has worked tirelessly to create robust programming for the Gardner Center. We all benefit from her intelligence and creativity. Those eye-opening lectures delivered by scholars and artists from around the world certainly brightened our otherwise gloomy Saturday mornings in Seattle. Next slide, please. Here's a list of Saturday University lecture series in the last 11 years. The topics really covered a lot of ground from health, sex, and women's rights in Asia to love, loss, and longing to empires that changed Asia and to Islam across Asia. Oh, thanks to Sarah's incredible work. So thank you, Sarah, from all of us. Next slide, please. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Professor Timon Screech, who will be speaking to us on fire and renewal in Edo period Japan. Professor Screech teaches Japanese art history at the School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS, at the University of London. His research focuses on the art and culture of early modern Japan. A quick thinker and a prolific writer, he has authored 13 monographs to date and numerous articles and book chapters. His book has also been translated into Japanese, French, Korean, Polish, and Romanian. Last year alone, he published two books. One is titled The Shogun's Silver Telescope, God, Art, and Money in the English Quest for Japan, 1600 to 1625. Centered on the early history of the English East Indian Company, 
that was founded in 1600. It tells the little known story of Britain's first trade with Japan. Reading this book, I learned as much, if not more, about British history as about Edo Japan. And the second book is titled Tokyo Before Tokyo, Power and Magic in the Shogun's City of Edo. I think the title alone is quite enticing. Professor Screech openly admits he has political convictions. So don't even get him started about current world affairs because we only got about one hour today. But if you have any question about today's lecture, please do put them in the Q&A and we'll try to answer as many as our time allows. Also, a brief survey will pop up at the end of the lecture and before the Q&A. We would appreciate it if you could fill out the survey. Now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Screech. So am I, am I live now? Good, so um, thank you everyone very much for uh, joining us uh, from so many places. I can see there's almost 200 participants, which is a huge honor for me to, um, to be able to address you. I know there are people from uh, all over the USA, from Brazil, from England, and I'm sure many other places too, so thank you. I also, of course, thank the Seattle Art Museum and the Gardner Center, and I'm truly honored to be starting this next in your um, more than decade long series of wonderful talks. Uh, well, it is topical. Um, we're living in a time of crisis. Uh, you in the USA, possibly, according to your politics, may be emerging from one, or maybe some, anyway, I'm not here to talk about American politics, but let me begin by sharing with you my first slide. So, uh, Japan. Now, many of you know the country, many of you are probably from there, but just for those who, who are not sure, uh, take a look at it, because we may often think of troubles uh, as human uh, creations, uh, politics, of course, but also wars, invasions, religious friction, gender friction, ethnic friction, all these things. And of course, Japan is no different. But where Japan is different, is in its extraordinarily dangerous topography. That if you look at the country, it's a mass of um, mountains and valleys and fissures and I have to say fissures, <laughs> breaks, and um, uh, all kinds of things in this kind of landscape are very apt to going wrong. If you look at the dark green, which is mountains, you'll see that's most of the country. If you look at the uh, brownish part, which is the low, uh, which is the flatland, there's only three or four areas sufficient to support much in the way of human habitation. And over the course of history, from the beginnings almost, the uh, area, I think you can see my cursor, around the inland sea here, this is on the whole rather safe because it is not so prone to earthquakes and the bad thing about earthquakes is not in themselves, but they create fires, uh, coals topple out of burners, stoves fall over, and of course also tsunamis. So this area is relatively speaking safe. And of course, um, Kyoto is in there. Kyoto you will note is not a seaport. Uh, I'm from London, you're in Seattle, New York, uh, many, many uh, um, ancient cities and significant cities are ports, people move by water, but Kyoto is not. And it was uh, probably because of the danger inherent on being on the exposed coast. Well, um, that was the, um, beginning. But Japan has a way of fracturing. The mountains are such that it's very hard for any government to extend its political reach all across the country. Uh, places kind of broke off and did their own thing. And on the whole, the biggest division you can see kind of here, there's a line going right across the country uh, and mountains here, and this is around Mount Fuji. So Mount Fuji is the symbol of Japan, uh, the undying beautiful mountain, snow-capped for much of the year, but of course it was also a, a active volcano and the areas around it prone to um, violent explosions. Even when you didn't have 
uh, an explosion. You have mountains, you have torrents, you have bears, wolves, brigands, and moving around uh, from the uh, this kind of area, which is fairly flat, to this kind of area, which is fairly flat, would always be very difficult. The um, court that had ruled Japan uh, from early exposure to Chinese civilization kind of gave up or it was forced to give up. And a group of warrior people that had been originally courtiers that had kind of gone up to the east and, 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 and installed themselves here and notionally were looking after the wild east on behalf of the Kyoto court uh, rather took over. And we get the creation of a shogunate. The first shogunate ruled from Kamakura. And Kamakura, unlike um, Kyoto, is on the coast. It was a grand city and um, uh, a very, very fine one, and, and elements of it even survive today, but it succumbed to a tsunami. And if you've been there, you'll have been to see the great Buddha of Kamakura, roughly the date uh, on here a little bit later, and um, it stands out of doors now because the um, housing for it, huge hall, was simply washed away and never rebuilt. Well, Kamakura continued to exist as a city, but before very long, it was abandoned as a major center of um, culture and, 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 and politics. We get then uh, the creation, probably to have been there for a long time, but the kind of formalization of the great highway to link here on the right hand side, the first plot is today's Tokyo, Edo, and all the way down to Kyoto. Now this is called the Tokaido, the East Sea Road. You can still walk it today. Most of the original highway is still there. Parts of it are uh, modern day uh, trucks going past, but many of it, much of it is very quiet and lovely still. Some parts of it are even dirt roads or uh, with original stone. And it'll take you almost exactly two weeks to work, to walk it. So however violent the land was, however many wolves and bears and torrents and the risk of um, uh, uh, tidal waves there was, this road um, bound the country together and it was um, kept to do so. Well, Kamakura um, no longer served as home. The second shogunate, Japan has had three, operated out of Kyoto. But then 1600, or to be precise, 1603, Japan's third shogunate came into existence. And uh, the first shogun of that line decided for all kinds of reasons, uh, we haven't got time to go into today, but he would move his center of administration, not the capital, the capital remained in Kyoto where the emperor was, but his center of administration back to the Kamakura area. He had a kind of revival urge to recreate what they thought of as the glorious ancient days when Kamakura had been the military capital. But he didn't dare, sensibly enough, build it actually in Kamakura, much too dangerous. So of course you can see the good thing about Tokyo Edo is that although it is uh, on the coast and therefore it can be accessed by ships, it is in a bay and so it's not prone to tsunami. A tsunami could hardly possibly get in there. Uh, it also had the advantage, think of the year about 1600, that major ships can't get in. Oops, sorry, major ships can't get in. And if you talk about major ships at this time, you're thinking about the Spanish and the Portuguese, whose goods uh, the shoguns certainly wanted. Uh, and to a certain extent, they tolerated the arrival of uh, missionaries too. But they certainly didn't want ships uh, with onboard cannon coming right up close to their major city. So Edo then becomes the center of the um, Japan's actual government uh, from 1600 approximately. And it's built into an enormous, beautiful, huge city. Um, it's not exposed to tsunami, that's good, but it is highly exposed to earthquakes. And those of you who lived in Tokyo will know that they happen quite frequently. Uh, those of you who've lived in Kyoto as well as Tokyo or Northern Kyoto, they don't happen very frequently, and it's probably why the capital was put there in the first place. But having decided to govern from the east, the Edo regime was governing from a very volatile area seismically. So one is earthquakes. You never know when they come. You can build in a certain way to kind of obviate the danger, but you can't really do anything about them. 
as I said, the real problem of, of earthquakes is um, fire. And uh, fire was the huge hazard of Japanese life. Even without an earthquake, buildings are of wood, uh, and so that a fire will spread very, very quickly. And thus by shogunal decree, all buildings in Edo had to have tiled roofs and uh, the huge tile furnaces located just outside the city because of course fire is required for firing roof tiles, which itself could be a source of uh, potential conflagration to outside as gone. And then a later shogun also uh, decreed something that remains uh, a presence in Japanese uh, rural areas, which is that every family must have access to a fireproof storehouse in which you keep your um, records, uh, de title deeds, uh, deeds of marriage, and families ought to be able to trace their ancestry and their lineage via surviving documents. So uh, fire was something that they tried to do something about as much as they could. However, you can't stop it happening eventually. And Edo having been um, created around about 1600. Shogun is officially nominated in 1603. In 1657, there was the first tremendously enormous fire. And I'm sorry, these two maps are oriented um, in different ways. So if you, can, if you can imagine that the one on the left, if you could rotate it 50 degrees, I tried to uh, rotate it 180 degrees, I tried to do that, but my Photoshopping skills were not adequate. So you can see the river, obviously should be going in the same direction in both maps. And the left-hand one tells you the lie of the city. The orange is the samurai districts, the red is the commoner districts, and the purple is the um, religious institutions, basically Buddhist temples. And then on the right-hand side is the amount of destruction in the so-called furisode, fire. Uh, it transformed uh, the whole appearance of the city. It was never rebuilt in the way that it had been before. It was certainly was not the last um, conflagration either, but it was one that remained in the memory and certain um, uh, literary tracts, if that's the right word, historical memoirs were written about that fire, which people continue to read throughout the period. So it stood in the way that actually, since I'm from London, the Great Fire of London um, remained in people's memories as just something that was awful and truly horrendous and um, nobody knew why. Uh, the Meireki Fire, the so-called Furisode, Furisode, by the way, is a young girl's um, uh, pre-married woman's kimono. And one theory of the fire was that uh, a girl was not being careful enough when she was um, drying her kimonos. But anyway, that was just a late subsequent myth. The fire um, spread throughout the city and gave rise not just to stories of horrors, but a kind of art existence too. And I'm only showing you one detail, but many of these uh, scrolls not only document the fire, and we're presuming that an artist would have seen that, but of course you wouldn't have sat there sketching it. So it's always going to be based on memory, uh, based on um, aspirations sometimes that here the fire brigades appear to be extremely well organized, uh, everyone bravely uh, attending to the fires. Were they really doing that? Maybe people ran away from their jobs, but the end of the scrolls often have a kind of peace. Uh, the city was gone, but being a city of wood, the city can be re-resurrected. Now, what was lost in that fire of 1657 particularly was the keep of the Shogun's castle. And Edo Castle, which today has been repurposed as the Imperial Palace now that uh, Edo is Tokyo and the Emperor lives there, but had been the Shogun's Castle and the enormous soaring uh, keep, seven story high, uh, dominated the entire city. Uh, it simply disappeared. And after the fire, of course, the thing you imagine the government would do would be to rebuild the castle tower. They did not. They decided very publicly not to rebuild it. And this was a kind of build to the city as a way of telling the people, um, we are going without certain things that we would like uh, as a ruler, ruling dynasty. We, we want our castle, but we know that it's paid for out of your taxes. Uh, and that the bigger we build our castle, the less food and space and comforts 
you the people have. And they were making a reference to a very ancient Japanese legend of a mythical emperor who went up to the roof of his castle and looked down and couldn't see any smoke rising from the city. And he asked his minister why. And the minister said, well, the, you, you, your castle's so big, the people's taxes are very high, they can't afford any food, so there's no cooking fires. And the emperor was so shamed by this that he um, let the castle fall into ruins. And it says that even um, dew would soak his bed at night because the castle um, was not even a castle anymore. So that notion of the, the ruler who um, uh, foregoes things for the good of the people is a very ancient one, but in this case, it was having built the city in an area of earthquakes prone to fires. Commoners are going to lose their homes occasionally. The Shogun will lose his too and will not demand preferential treatment in what happens afterwards. As well as not building their castle, um, they did build something which was a special temple to commemorate the people who'd lost their lives. And it was built across a brand new bridge. You just saw the, the river. Previously, the river had demarcated the edge of the city. There wasn't really anything beyond and therefore there was no bridge over it. But now there's a realization that that river might be an escape route for people in the future. And so the Ryogoku Bridge, the bridge of two countries or two states going from Edo, the city across to a different domain the other side and that temple survives today and because it was so powerful in the memory of the people but at the same time being a rather late arrival on the Edo religious scene it didn't have any parishioners and therefore it had a way of laying on um, shows and fairs and things like that to bring in money and so we see in this much later print of a kind of rigged up um, space for a fairground to take place. And it's intriguing that this place which was created to mem memorialize the people who'd lost their lives in the fire became a site, site of fairground behavior, right? And so that loss is completely sandwiched with revival and even a kind of um, joy. And as the years went by, this print by Hiroshige is uh, approaching 200 years after the fire, of course, people had sort of um, forgotten. And another thing which they both forgot and did not forget was that the Shogun's castle did not have a keep anymore. So I show you a vision of it before the fire and then a print which I'm sure you are familiar with, one of um, Hokusai's famous 36 views of Mount Fuji, where there we are on a different bridge. It's not the bridge across the big river. It's a smaller bridge looking down to the Shogun's castle, which has no keep. Right? And because the bridge which Hokusai is showing us here was the very center of Edo, it functioned as the Trafalgar Square in London or perhaps the, the mall. I don't know if Seattle has a, a, an official center like that. Many cities do. And Edo's official center was this bridge. So anyone standing on it, which you would do repeatedly as you went about your your life would look towards the castle, of course, you'd look and you'd see, ah, the Shogun does not have his castle keep. He was taken away by fire and he virtuously, generously left his keep denuded. But instead of the keep, you have also something which the bridge was in fact built to incorporate into the vista in the days before the castle keep was lost, which of course was Mount Fuji. Uh, so he have this um, vista, right? It's like looking down the, um, the, the mall in Washington or looking down the um, uh, Champs Elysees or something. It's a constructed vista in which you see power, authority, the loss of authority, and then also, well, no, I mean, the loss of the, the, of the, the appearance of authority. The Shogun is not losing his authority at all. He's just losing his, his bombastic, huge, expensive keep. And then Mount Fuji, the, um, uh, the beautiful, the fearsome, uh, shining over it. The fire of 1657 remained eternally in the memory. People, as I said, read about it, pictures made of it, stories of it would have continued. But then it wasn't the last. The next disaster I want to mention to you uh, was not a fire, but a famine. And we are so accustomed to having access to all the material goods we should want, we are likely to forget that the um, non-appearance of the sun 
the non-appearance of the rain giving rise to a poor harvest in which people bitterly suffer was something that people would have just simply known. And the so-called uh, Tenmei family, the, the, the 1780s in Japan are known as the Tenmei period, the Tenmei famine uh, was horrendous. Uh, it said that um, cannibalism became rife and many tropes, because famine happens so often, that these, these literary tropes that people say people were doing, whether they really were or not, we don't know. We, we hope they weren't. But one of the tropes is that mothers would um, tear the faces off their children, and fry them. I, I'm sure there's some mothers in the room. It's inconceivable, right? But it's just a way of saying it got that bad. And here we have a, a painting of it, and it certainly shows people um, eating uh, human flesh. As the Tenmei fire was even underway, uh, Mount Asama erupted. Mount Asama is nothing like Mount Fuji. Uh, it's much further towards the, um, uh, to, to, toward, well, closer to Edo actually, further, further east. And so um, its eruption was cataclysmic. Not only people were killed by lava, but the ash blocked out the sun for uh, weeks and weeks. And it happened at a time when uh, the crops should have been ripening and they couldn't ripen. And then dead bodies and animals came floating down that river you saw. And so the Temme fire again figures as a huge memory of how dangerous and awful this world can be. We live in it and in some ways we love it, but it's an unpredictable and fearsome place. The eruption of Mount Asama left this very large mountain denuded. And here we see a print, a painting, sorry, a screen painting from considerably later. Um, this is into the 19th century, probably uh, two decades afterwards, where we see the mountain still completely without trees. Uh, there's smoke emerging from it, the danger it might erupt again. Uh, something is going on, on the left and there's some cut logs as well. So I'm not quite sure this screen today exists only in this half. It must have had another half on the left at one time. We don't know. This shows us destruction and living not just through destruction, but with the um, results of it, which are ongoing. It's possible to speculate the lost left-hand side might have had some sort of renewal, perhaps Mount Fuji in its glory or um, well, we can't possibly say, uh, but I'd like to think that along with this devastation, the artist Aodo Denzen would offer some kind of consolation too. And if you think this is the right hand screen, which it must be because compositionally the left is kind of vacant, we need to follow on that. Uh, the right hand screens always come first in Japan. So this is disaster. And the one on the left might have shown some kind of um, resolution and um, assuagement after it. The destruction of Mount Asama, of course, can't be um, experienced today. Uh, and there hasn't been mercifully a dreadful earthquake in a major urban area in Tokyo, in Japan for quite a long time. Um, but if you go to some, the other side of the mountain, you will still see the landscape left by the eruption of 18, 1783. It has this lovely name, uh, Onyoshidani, so it's the valley of what the demons extrusion that's my translation and someone might have a better one that the demons have kind of like pulled this stuff out of the earth and dumped it all over our landscape which has become filled with um, bracken and impossible to farm no uh, possibility of human life here today of course people go to um, have a kind of a lunar experience and it's a nice place for tourism but it would not have been seen that way this is where uh, the devils live and you never know with devils when they might come back. However, if you walk there today, and uh, I went there a couple of months ago, you will see dotted through the landscape lanterns. And I've not been able to establish when the lanterns were put here. It may be that they were put here um, somewhat later, but it's intriguing that the landscape that has no function, you can't farm it, you can't inhabit it, should be illuminated. And as you walk around uh, this horrible, frightening hillside, you repeatedly are offered illumination. 
and it must be that the lanterns were lit today they never are you would have had a candle inside and then you can see there'd be um the square bit here would have a kind of paper uh, um, uh, lampshade kind of thing so it doesn't blow out but the side parts would uh, um, you know there's a, in other words it's, it's a it's, it's a translucent lantern it doesn't cast light very uh, broadly but what it allows you to do is walk from one to the other almost functioning a bit like um, lighthouses to lead your way and if you go up close to them have a look you'll see that they're inscribed and they're inscribed by um, well they have the date and they have here um, Taiyuin Dono. This is the name of the shogun. He um, donated the lanterns, it would appear, or what I think happened, but I'm not able to prove this, but I think what happened is that these were originally used at the shogun's graves. Right? When the shoguns died, obviously, they had enormous elaborate graves, and these would have um, processional routes studded with lanterns. After a certain number of years with all the funeral rituals um, completed, many of the lanterns would no longer be serviceable and so no longer functionable, and so that they would be sent off somewhere. And if you go to many Japanese temples today, you'll see temples have been given this kind of honorific gift of a lantern from a shogun or gravesite. Uh, and this is there. So it's like the shogun is illuminating, telling you this, offering something from himself. It's kind of a warning, right? This is the way the world is, we can't change it. But he's saying, you have government. If you have benign government that cares, which the shoguns of course would very much want people to think that, however they might have actually governed, uh, then uh, things are safe for you because we are governing you. When uh, Mount Asama uh, exploded and right in the middle of the Temme fires, one particular regional lord whose land was a little bit further away, so he wasn't likely to get any lava coming down, but he could have uh, had suffered from the um, famine. That particular lord, let it be known for the shogun in the capital, who was a relation of his, that none of his peasants had died, much less than peeling the faces off their children and eating them, eating human flesh. He had governed his land so well, so benevolently, so carefully, that not one peasant um, had even died. And that was Matsudaira Sadonobu. Matsudaira Sadonobu was a grandson of a previous shogun. He always felt that he ought to have been shogun himself. He never got that. So he was always very out to demonstrate for everyone uh, what a virtuous ruler he was and what a unfortunate mistake it was that they took somebody else's shogun rather than him. And so this story put about, if it was true or not, who knows, that he had governed his own land with such benevolence. Uh, and of course that meant foregoing things himself, that thing, that food was spread around. Partly as a result of this reputation he'd fostered for himself, he was elected chief, well, elected not nominated, chief um, shogun or counselor. Right at the end of that Tenmei period, in the 1780s. Um, Sadonobu has been a figure of particular interest to me and I even um, wrote a book about him called The Shogun's Painted Culture, if any of you are motivated to take a look at that. It's out of print sadly, but I think you can find it secondhand. Um, and Sadonobu um, said this, not in relation to uh, Asama, but in general. He said, if Edo did not have frequent fires, then people would be more showy and flash. In the capital, what today we call Kyoto, in the capital or in Osaka, they do everything with lavish elegance. People hang up paintings in their homes or put out arrangements of flowers. But in Edo, even in affluent areas, everything is restrained. People only display a single flower in a bamboo tube or pot. Um, the wealthy have fine chess sets, but the box will have paper fixed under the lid to double up as a board. Edo's sense of conciseness comes from its continual fires. And uh, probably a lot of us today think of Japan as being very good with natty little implements. They're so good at uh, miniaturizing stuff. Uh, but as far as uh, Sadanobu is implying here, that's not a feature of Japanese culture. 
that's a feature of Edo. And it's come about not because the Japanese have any kind of ancestral love of little things, but because you have to be able to gather up your stuff and flee at a moment's notice. So even wealthy people, uh, they don't have a chess set, a box and a chess board. The lid of the box is the chess board and therefore you are saving, not space, but saving materials. Uh, and of course you would have your government decreed family storehouse in which you put the things that you probably can't flee with when the sudden call to alarm for fire occurs. Excuse me. Fire uh, then has a kind of symbolic value to it. Uh, it is after all what many cultures associate with hell. If you are caught in a fire, then you are actually experiencing hell. And if after the fire comes some assuasion, government hands out food, whatever, then it is the government which is saving you from hell. And in Buddhist thought, it's a little different in Christianity or in Islam or Judaism, perhaps, I'm not sure, that in Buddhism that you can be saved, that, that a Buddha, um, there are one or two Buddhas whose responsibility it is to come down and whisk people out from hell if they um, merit being saved in that way. Uh, the fire uh, in this very intriguing allegorical painting, which is now in a private collection um, in New York, and nobody's ever really been able to exactly say quite what's going on in it. I certainly don't have um, a, uh, a response, and I'm the one who's given it the title of Allegory of Firefighting. The owner may have a different view, but we see um, a work attributed to Shiba Korkan, uh, who is painting probably towards the end of that uh, Tenmei period. Uh, and he has given us three figures seated around uh, a table, which Japanese don't do, right? Japanese is on the floor. So we're in some sort of um, intercultural space here. And in the clouds above is a dreadful fire taking place in which I think we see th the three different cultures Chinese person sitting on the left, Japanese in the middle, and the a Dutch person or European right, are each putting out a fire according to their own understanding. And the table at which they sit, we have not actually fire materials, fire is above. We have here this Dutchman who has a anatomical book. And you can even see that it's open on a page derived from one of the very famous anatomical drawings of Vesalius, the first person ever to articulate a skeleton, uh, which he did in Italy uh, in Renaissance time. So this is a very old book, but the image was circulated. And then we have what appears to be a Chinese sage, and I'm happy to uh, be instructed by somebody who knows better, but this clearly is some figure to do with uh, learning, understanding, uh, assuasion, care, healing, who has not a Western book, but a scroll, and then this um, uh, implement associated often with uh, high-ranking clerics. The Japanese figure intrigues me most and I can't unpack it today. Him, I can't unpack him at all, but I certainly haven't got time to do today. He has a crest, this should be identifiable, but it's not yet been identified. Around his wrist is uh, a serpent, which I believe is a um, medical reference. So um, fire uh, happens. It is the job of rulers to uh, assuage it, to deal with it, and to console as a result of what might happen. Well, the Temme famine, the eruption of Mount Asama, if that wasn't bad enough, 1788, still in that Temme period, Kyoto burnt down. Now, Edo, as we just saw from Matsuda Sadanobu's comments, uh, Edo burnt down all the time because it was in a earthquake zone. It's worth, I've never seen an Edo period person say this, but it's worth pointing out that fire does purify. And although a lot of people die in fires, an awful lot more rats and germs die in fires. So it may be that Edo didn't have the terrible pestilence that many European cities had because of the fires. However, Edo, deals with fires. But Kyoto was not 
prone to fires. You couldn't say it never had any, but they were very infrequent. And one then happened in the year 1788. The um, loss was astronomical. Here, this is a map of the period. Kyoto, some of you are familiar. This is the Kamo, the river Kamo that comes down. Oops, if I touch the screen. Uh, this is the, um, the Royal Palace, which of course had uh, uh, great moats and things, so that's saved. Equally, the Shogun's castle, Nijo Castle, was also saved. But everything else pretty much was gone. If I show you, it just popped up too early, but I'll show it to you again now. That same thing drawn over a modern map of Kyoto. You can see how much went. Everything from the river right up to the Shogun or castle. And um, here, interestingly enough, modern day historical archeologists have come to the conclusion that the Imperial Palace did burn down. This map has shown it not burnt down for political reasons. Uh, if the emperor's pa palace is gone, but the Shogun's castle remains, then people are gonna start saying, does that mean the emperor is less virtuous than the Shogun? Because there's usually an assumption that these fires, they're human caused, but the heavens have a hand in it. And very intriguingly at this fire of 1788, who should happen to be in town? But just after it, not during it, just after it, the um, Dutch East India Company representatives in Japan came through and they recorded all kinds of things which local people did not record, uh, partly because the local people are so distraught and they've lost their house, they're not gonna start writing um, things down necessarily. But the Dutch, they'd never seen an event like this, they recorded it and they tell us some extraordinary stories which the Japanese do not record. They say, for example, that the palace did burn down and in order to get the emperor out, his guards drew their swords and cut 2,000 people down in the streets to clear the way for the Empress Palanquin to get out. Now you can well see such a record could not possibly be maintained from the Japanese side. Anyone saying such a thing would have been whisked off to some sticky end almost immediately. And so for the shogunate to say our castle survived and to tolerate a notion that the Empress, castle, Empress Palace survived too is a way of saying that we have to reconstruct after the fire and therefore our lands are saved, although we won't reconstruct flamboyantly. <clears throat> the loss of Kyoto was not only terrifying in human terms, but also after all, Kyoto was the capital. It was more than a thousand years old by the time this fire struck. Of course, it had had problems before there'd been <coughs> warfare, <coughs> but um, Kyoto was sort of seen as something eternal in the way that Rome is seen as eternal, even though of course Rome's had fire and destruction as well. So people wanted to know, why did Kyoto burn down? Don't say some woman was careless with a stove. We want to know an existential reason. And here I'm quoting you from a, a, a courtier who did write something down, I said people didn't, but he did anything back. Now, remember, what can the gods mean by this. Remember, remember, and think how it can be that the passing of the generations have brought us to this point. The emperor of the Enryaku era, that's the one who built Kyoto in the, as you can see, a very eighth century, he moved uh, the, the capital to this place with mountains for its hems and a river for its girdle, erecting stout palace pillars, surely blessing enough for 100 million years he laid out the city to conform with a geomantic diagram of the four be beasts to be a changeless abode for his household. That's what should have happened. How deprived times have come when a fire can break out, even here. Now, Matsudara Sadanobu was Shogun chief minister at this moment. He was living in Edo. He went down to Kyoto, one of the only times he'd spared to, uh, from his government uh, duties to go down to Kyoto, he surveyed the destruction. And what should happen But the emperor should buttonhole him. And the emperor said, I've lost my palace. Right? He came clean about it, anyone could see. I've lost my palace. And he said, well, actually, 
my palace wasn't very big. So when we rebuild it, I'd like a proper full-size palace. And he even said, my throne has to be 12 steps up and I have this and that and the other. And Matsudai Sultanab was not very keen on doing this. Uh, at the same time, the emperor is a semi-sacred figure. You can't just say no to him. Having had this official request from the court, he debated what to do. And as he went back to uh, Edo, having seen the destruction in Kyoto, so two weeks back along the highway I showed you, he stopped on the way back at the first shogun's gravesite. Gravesite. And it was pouring with rain. And he said, I'm, I'm going to go in and venerate the shogun's uh, spirit, of course, going past it. And he said, if when I come out, we have brilliant sunshine and the rain has stopped, I will take that to mean that the spirit of the shogun wants the emperor to have the big fancy palace he's asked for. And obviously it's pouring with rain, <laughs> no, no chance. Uh, he's gonna be able to uh, excuse himself to the emperor and say that the spirit of the first shogun won't allow it. This first shogun, who of course was so modest in his own um, requirements, they would say. And so Matsudala Southern Nobu makes his prayers and goes out afterwards and guess what? It's brilliant sunshine. So the emperor gets his palace. And uh, it was, one imagines, um, extremely unpopular uh, on the part of the people. The Dutch, once again, say some things that is never recorded in the Japanese source, which is the emperor forbade anyone to acquire wood until he had enough wood to rebuild his own palace. So there's always a struggle going on in Japan between the court in Kyoto and the shogunate about who is top, uh, the adjudication of rules, they have their own, they tolerate each other's existence and they acknowledge the importance of each other's existence, but they're always kind of like jockeying. And I think Matsudana Sadanobu saw this as, a, as an opportunity to enhance <coughs> the um, moral authority of a shogunate, which was approaching 200 years, right? I told you 1603 was the shogunate. This place burnt down 1788. It's not very long before with the 200th anniversary. Not many shogunates last for 200 years. Not many regimes around the world last for 200 years, do they? Uh, so I think he's buffing up the uh, moral credentials, credentials which have been available to do in response to a disaster. Now, um, I'm not going to give you a list of disasters because that would become a little bit um, boring. I've given you the Great Fire of 1657 and the famine, um, Mount Asama eruption and the fire of Kyoto all in the 1770s. But one other thing um, does merit, oops, sorry, I, I'm, I'm well ahead of myself. Come back to the fire. After the fire was um, over the Kyoto, people did get to rebuild their houses, the palace was rebuilt. And the Kano School, which is the school of the um, official shogun or painters pr principally, produced this painting. It shows um, Guo Ziyi and his great-grandchildren. Now, Guo Ziyi was a Chinese general, uh, well known for his military exploits, but he lived a very, very long time. And so he got to see vast numbers of children uh, and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren living a long time and having your family line proliferate, of course, was the ultimate um, happiness for people uh, in those the way of thinking they had. And so for this to be shown and just after the uh, fire is a way of saying, uh, we will continue. Now the temple is it's in today in the Shokokuji temple, uh, which is an old, um, a beautiful temple in Kyoto, but it wasn't originally, originally there. It was given by the emperor who's got his big palace. And it was delivered to the, um, to the Shokokuji temple as it today by the former prince abbot of the Rinnoji. Now the Rinnoji is the temple that celebrates the deification of the first shogun. So imagine this, it is the shogun's custodian, right? The custodian of his graves, who presumably commissions the painting, has it given to the emperor and the emperor passes it on to one of the great temples. And the Shokokuji was one of the few temples that did not burn down in the fire. That's probably why it was the recipient of these screens. So there's, um, this seems to be now uh, a, a different way of apportioning uh, honorifics and uh, 
uh, uh, thanks for continuity. The shogun is taking it all under Matsudaya Sadanobu's uh, kind of uh, imprint, but here the court is also um, celebrating. We will all go on. This is the image I was thought was going to come up again. So um, I, I'm not going to uh, give you a list of fires, but 10 years after that, the Great Buddha Hall in Kyoto burnt down. Now you remember from the map of the fire, the river was the edge of the fire. So everything on the other side of Kyoto River uh, did not burn. And the other side happened to have Japan's biggest building, which was the Hall of the Great Buddha erected in um, about 1588, so uh, 200 years old by this point. And it too suddenly um, caught fire. Uh, being near the river, it didn't burn out the rest of the city, it just went up on its own. It was never rebuilt, and that's why, well actually a little, little bit rebuilt, but that's why there's no great Buddha in Kyoto today, as you'll have noticed. But what is especially intriguing about this painting is that it's, I'm um, just trying to get my viewing thing out of the way. Can, can you see that the artist Rosetsu has not only painted the Buddha hall going up, but his own signature is singed, right? See on the left, he signed it in black as you normally would do, but the black of his own signature is turning red. And then as the fly, fire goes up, you can see here, this kind of like um, striped pattern, this indicates that he painted it directly onto a tatami mat. Normally you'd put a pad under it so that the mat grain doesn't come through. But he's obviously wanted it to come through. He's showing you something immediate, right? Personally um, damaging to him, his, his name, his artistic identity is being singed by this, right? And the loss of the Great Buddha Hall of Kyoto was astronomically um, upsetting to people. You can imagine whatever your own religious faith or whatever your own cultural identity might be, the one building that you think is most emblematic of what you are uh, to go up in smoke. And it wasn't even um, uh, a war or a thunderbolt or a tsunami, it just caught fire. So uh, Rosetsu's uh, painting stands out as something very, very special. And today it's a um, much displayed artifact. He never said what he meant by it. The painting, of course, stands for itself. It's not very big. So there's an element in this, not like that screen we just saw the emperor put, gave the temple, which would be out on display and 100, 100 people could look at it all at the same time. But this is for sort of personal contemplation and maybe even the artist himself owned it. I, I'm not aware of um, whether its provenance is at all known. Well, now, um, before I stop, I've got one little other thing to say to you which is that Rosetsu was alive here, 1780s. Uh, Shiva Korkan, I mentioned, who painted the Allegory of Fire. They are aware of the existence of Western art. Japan uh, is often said to have been closed and that's an overstatement. But in any case, the second half of the 18th century is a particularly open moment. And the fact that the Tenmei famine uh, brought such terrible um, results that the government is looking towards um, new drainage, new uh, water management, new farming techniques, new pumping techniques, and so that what they call Dutch studies uh, became quite significant. Now the um, Dutch of course are in Japan and they have to every now and again give presents and towards the end of the 17th century after the fire of 1657, which I began with, the Dutch were told the Shogun has lost his art collection in the fire. We would like you to replace some of the Dutch type things he had before. And so the Dutch um, turn up with some paintings. And the Dutch are very good at maritime art. And at that particular time, the end of the mid to late 18th century, the Dutch, I'm embarrassed to say, were at war with the British repeatedly. And the Dutch had taken to making war paintings, uh, today highly admired, and Willem van der Velde is often cited as the best example. Of course, I'm not saying a Willem van der Velde painting came to Japan, but at any rate, a painting of a 
battle at sea did come. And the Dutch brought it into the port of Nagasaki and they showed it to the governor of Nagasaki and the governor of Nagasaki said, it's fantastic, the Shogun's gonna be absolutely over the moon about this. In fact, he liked it so much, he even wanted to display it in his own governor's mansion for a while, but he decided he better not because if it gets damaged, then he will probably have to um, commit suicide. Right? So it's given back to the Dutch to look after until it's conveyed. And then the um, governor says, can I look at it again? Just before presentation of the Shogun. And he looked at it again and he says, there's a problem with that painting. It shows sad sights. It shows ships sinking and people in distress. And presumably the Dutch said, well, yes, it's a battle painting. But the governor says, you uh, can't give that to the Shogun. It's inauspicious to search such things. Now, this um, story about uh, Dutch liking pictures of maritime distress got about in Japan. And um, Shiba Kokan, who made the Allegory of Fire, which we saw, who's well known for his interest in Western things, uh, wrote this down. He said that, um, once upon a time, there was a Dutch group coming through Edo and one of the Dutch um, representatives got very sick and they thought he was going to die, but he recovered. And so they held a party to celebrate his recovery. The man who'd been ill sat in a chair and behind him, the Dutch had hung a painting of a ship in distress sinking. And the Japanese said to them, what on earth do you think you're doing? How unfortunate is that? And the Dutch reply, we think that you should never forget danger. The Japanese, um, according to what Korkan writes, he said, in Japan, if somebody's sick and then recovers, we would paint, a, we would hang a painting of cranes with pine trees and terrapins with bamboo, because these are auspicious signs. I hope that I've been able to show you a little bit about the particularities of the Japanese in spatial environment, which has given rise to certain kinds of disasters and equally how the recurrence of these things has left memories, but also left ways in which you deal with them in practical terms with roof tiles and storehouses, but also in terms of culturally, how you create auspiciousness, how you as a ruler, um, promote to the people that you even care about them. And with that, I think I've come to the end of my time. So I will um, stop sharing now and um, pass back to the hosts. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And um, please put your question in the Q&A. And we will start with, um, with, with the question about Rosette's burning of Buddha Hall. Where yes. is that painting? Someone was asking. Um, it would be perfectly easy to find the answer to that question. I'm sorry, I can't give it to you off the top of my head. Um, it's, it's often reproduced. If, um, um, if Xiao Jin doesn't mind, um, I can send you the I can send the museum the response to that as soon as I can get hold of the, of the document. I'm sorry not to be able to tell you straight away. Okay, great, yeah. Um, and then someone was asking, did people ever raid the store houses? I, I, I guess mm -hmm. she meant in Edo. And did the government ever steal from the storehouses? Did they charge the people who have those storage? Um, random theft of the storehouses probably occurred. Um, it's not usually reported since so many people had them. They were kind of all over the place. Um, what you do get recorded is people who are using their storehouse to accumulate improperly. So somebody's reputed to be, you know, they're overcharging in their business and their storehouse is filled with gold bars. Then there are instances of people taking it upon themselves to, to raid it. And it's often referred to as they, they're not stealing it, they're redistributing it. Um, but probably often storehouses had things which were of value to the family, but might not be of much value on the open market. Let's just say your, your, your deeds, your documents, something written, a letter by your grandfather and things. So the theft of goods from storehouses 
possibly happen in fact, but it doesn't occur as a kind of trope, right? I mean, being attacked on the highway and having your goods stolen is always a thing that people talk about, but they don't seem to talk about the danger of, um, of, of, of fires. And certainly the government is never on record of having opened somebody's storehouse and confiscated the goods, for example. And we have here another question, I guess a little bit more general. Um, is there much evidence of a diplomatic friction in art and material culture to suggest that foreign relations trade was frank, difficult, a threat in the pre-modern period? So not an art question, just related to the economics of it. Um, uh, so the, it's very tied up with the creation of the first shogunate, 1603, uh, after a very long period of civil war in which the shogunate wants to establish itself and probably to some extent the people want a, an, an effective government. Um, and as one of the uh, responses that there's a, con a curtailment of international trade, effectively when things are brought in by foreign traders, they must all be sold to the shogunate itself. Uh, in fact, the shogunate um, swaps them, trades them for Japanese copper, which was highly uh, regarded on the world market. So each year the Japanese side will say to the Dutch, uh, next year we're going to give you this much copper, so bring goods appropriate to it. And it becomes established how much will be, will be given. Later on, um, authorized merchants are unable to buy things from the goods. It's too difficult for the shogunate literally to be responsible for selling things. But it's not free trade either. And that's sometimes referred to as national isolation in Japan, um, but it's that's really too extreme a word. The um, trade was restricted to Nagasaki. Nagasaki is an excellent port, so restricting trade to Nagasaki is not in itself a problem. And from there, the Dutch would go up almost every year to offer, show, offer presents to the shogun and to his officers and his son and heir if he had one. Uh, and that was a diplomatic um, protocol that lasted almost for two centuries. So there's a question back from home from Suez. And oh. um, she's curious about the display of the Aodo Denzian screen of the yes. mountain Asama. Yes. Where would it have been displayed and who would have seen it? Yeah. I think there's a wider perhaps political religious motive behind such a display of destruction and um, renewal. Yes, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, in the absence of the other half of the pair of screens, it's very difficult to say. Aodo Denzen was um, much sponsored, patronized by that same Matsudaira, Sadanobu. And in fact, Aodo Denzen even came from Sadanobu's um, uh, domain. He wasn't a person from Kyoto or Edo. So it's perfectly possible that screen was commissioned by Sadanobu uh, to show what had happened to the landscape. And on the other side, it would have shown some virtuous um, government activity. But other than that, we can't really say. Um, but one thing to remember with screens is that they're almost like stage sets. Um, an important person sits in front of a screen and the screens kind of offset them so that you don't sort of look at a screen as we would look at a work of art in a, in a museum. And so one have to imagine what event would take place in front of that. And I imagine it's something about um, government policy, you know, a, the ministers are in, called in to discuss things in front of this vision of the dangerousness of the world, um, but the way that a righteous government can deal with it. And um, here's another question about the painting where it shows people starving and yeah. what's the purpose of that painting? Who was that made for? For sale or for the artist himself or commissioned by the emperor? Mm -hmm. Um, and also, are artists in Japan, like um, those in China, are they literati painters? Yeah, so two questions, both very good ones. Unfortunately, in Japan, unlike, um, you know, we're always very envious of people who work on Italian art and things, where you get contracts. And in Japan, there's hardly any um, contractual, written down contracts related to the creation of objects. So we have no idea who, um, who made it or, or where it was made. It is extremely rare painting. It's not like there are lots of paintings of people gnawing on um, a dead person's leg, right? So that painting is regularly brought out, as I brought it out to you in discussions of this, because it is so unusual. 
uh, and because normally you, you don't show inauspicious things. You can show a horror story that has a good resolution thanks to everyone pulling together. So if, if that had possibly, I mean, again, maybe it had a pendant to it that showed um, the restoration of moral um, order after the famine. But other than that, I'm afraid to say it's, it's simply impossible to say. The question about literati, um, so literati art is in Japan mostly amateur art, which means that you don't buy it and sell it, you do it for your friends, even if you kind of don't do it very well, it doesn't matter because it's for your own enjoyment. So it's quite a different thing from um, professional artists who learn to handle colors and to do draftsmanship and to paint on a big gold screen and things. Um, having said that, you do sometimes get amateur artists who are so good that people ask to buy their stuff and then of course they're not probably going to refuse to sell it. So you do also get a professional angle to literati painting, but it's billed as stuff you do to um, cultivate yourself, right? To, to, to understand what you are as a person rather than something you do to fulfill a commission to somebody who's gonna give you some gold at the end of it. So here we got some um, clues from the audience about um, the Rosette's painting. It yes. says it's in the Kishimoto Koichi collection in the Hyogo. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. Whoever, so, thank you very much, whoever found that. Very, very quick found Frank um, Chance. Thank you. And also, thank you, Frank. someone pro pointed out that Shiba Kokan's um, painting now is in the Minneapolis Art Institute collection. Aha, so it's, so the uh, previous owner has passed it on. Well, I'm delighted to know that it's in public hands now so more people can see it. Yeah, yeah. the last time I saw it, it was in a different collection. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, it does move around. And um, now as we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the 2011, 311 disaster. So here's someone who's thinking of that um, East Japan earthquake and asking what visual media do you think might have illustrated the govern government and empress desire to create auspiciousness in the wake of those multiple disasters? Yes, I mean people of course think very differently today. Uh, in the Edo period there would be much more of a kind of linked cosmos where um, what we do, what the government does, and what the heavens respond with are all part of a continuum and we don't think that today so there would be no um uh, you know making a picture of uh, cranes and terrapins and bamboo isn't going to help anyone um japan on the whole doesn't go in for big commemorative monuments things like the cenotaph and war memorials and even triumphal arches don't really exist so i think people would probably not think it was the, gov the job of government to, um, to do something like that, right? Of course, there's been massive amounts of things on a private level, lots and lots of literature, poetry, reflections uh, about, the, about the disaster. That's, uh, that's a huge, huge area of people kind of working through on their own, uh, in their own minds, a solution to it, but not on a government level, as far as I know. Um, we saw the picture of firefighting at the beginning of the talk, and someone's asking what kind of firefighting companies were there during yeah. the 18th century at all? Okay, good question. So they, um, they had fire brigades, uh, and uh, they would be, of course, by area. You couldn't travel very far. I mean, they'd be on foot. So they're, you're responsible for your little area. Around the city, there would also be fire watchtowers, and somebody would be up there uh, a lot of the time. Uh, certainly through the night, watching out, and there's a bell to ring in case it's necessary. Um, the firemen, on the whole, their job is to tear down buildings in the path of the fire to clear it. They don't do much in the way of throwing water over things. And when the Dutch turn up with mechanical pumps, that's regarded as um, very interesting in Japan. They have kind of um, almost like a water pistol type of pump in Japan, but you know, you could put about a big fire with that. If some, some person is a, a, light, a light, you know, terrible or, or something, you could just about extinguish it. But mostly firefighting is to um, tear down things in the wake, in the, in the pathway of a fire. And I think we have time for one last question. And I think it's, it's kind of a good way to end this. Um, this question's about um, 
you talk focused on art in response to disasters. What about art to prevent disasters? Uh, uh, thank you, you yes, yes. Images of Kano more prevalent as it was said to protect the believers from harm. Um, definitely, I mean, there's a lot of religious art as a way of, um, I mean, it's no different from other religions, right? That Kanon has a special ability to save people from flooding so that uh, you find Kanon in people who live around um, waterways or on ships. Um, there's also the uh, figures of the medicine Buddha, Yakshin Yorai, who will help people, you know, not just get better, but not get sick in the first place. So there's um, certainly a, a lot of that kind of thing. There's also less religious and probably a little bit more I don't want to say superstition because that makes like, it look as if we're passing judgment on people, but people even at the time would have known that it might not work, but why don't we give it a go? You know, little talisman type things. And I did a, a, a lot of work at one time on Shunga and Japanese erotica, and often erotica is said because it's about moistness, uh, is often said to be fire prevention. And there's many of the you know, elderly gentlemen that had a stack in his study and says, no, no, I've only got it to make sure that the house doesn't burn down. And so, and that was all regard, already regarded as a bit of tongue in cheek um, uh, at, at the time. So there would be, as there probably is with us today, genuine religious notions about prevention, but also a kind of gray area of, you know, we'll give it a try and it doesn't do any harm. I think that's a great note um, to end our program tonight and uh, thank you again so much Professor Screech. Pleasure, thank you all for listening. And thank you for um, all the audience who joined us today and we hope to see you again next Saturday.